In this video, we close our discussion of quantitative aspects of phase diagrams by deriving the integrated Clausius-Clapeyron equations. All right, so the Clausius-Clapeyron equations uh, are equations that allow you to predict what the slope of a couple of phase boundaries are in a phase diagram. Again, for the clausius clapeyron equation, you always have to look at uh, the final phase of the transition being a gas. So we're looking at the liquid to gas phase boundary and the solid to gas phase boundary. Uh, when you're interested in those phase boundaries, then the prediction of the slopes is very simple. You simply need to, know, need to have a knowledge of what the enthalpy of the phase transition is and uh, the pressure and the temperature uh, are given by whatever points um, you want to calculate that slope at. Well, great. Uh, so what we do now is, is try to see what else can we extract from these clausius clapeyron equations. All right, so here's kind of the rationale. Notice that that equation tells you uh, that if you're at this point, you can calculate the, the slope of that phase boundary. But of course, if you know what the slope of the phase boundary is, then you can forecast a different point in that phase boundary, right? So uh, if you know that, that you're in this particular point and the line changes with this slope, then you can predict uh, what would be that point, that next point in the line, right? So again, uh, uh, integrating this clausius clapeyron equation is going to allow, allow us to forecast an equilibrium point in a phase boundary from just a different equilibrium point that might be well now. Okay, so let's see uh, how that works out to be. All right, great. Uh, the way that we're going to do it is simply int integrate uh, or via integration of this uh, differential clausius clapeyron equation, right? So the first step is to simply separate variables. We're gonna put the pressures to the left-hand side of, uh, of the equation and the temperatures to the right-hand side of the equation. So this is going to be a uh, differential of t divided over t squared. And here we're going to have the change in enthalpy to phase, phase transition gas smaller divided over r. Right, so that's what happens when you separate variables. Well, very good. Now we just integrate. And we're going to integrate these two different ways. The first one is going to be using definite limits. OK, so that is going to go from a vapor pressure P1 to P2, the temperature T1, T2. What this definite integration with, with well-established limits uh, will allow us to do is this forecast, right? So notice that here you will have your T1 and P1, right? And what you're going to be able to do is predict what that T2 might be if you know what the vapor pressure is, or you can predict what the vapor pressure P2 will be at a particular temperature, temperature that you're interested in, T2. Okay, so, so that's uh, when, we, when you use this uh, definite integration. All right, so let's see how that works. Notice that that is simply the natural log of P2 over P1. And then to the left hand side, to the right hand side, we have uh, that the approximation is that this enthalpy of the phase transition is going to be temperature independent. And that is an approximation that is not always true. But it works reasonably well if the change in temperature that you're looking at is small enough. All right, so if this change from T1 to T2 is small enough, then, then it's a good approximation to say that the change in enthalpy in the phase transition will not change. That means that you can factor this out of the integral. R, of course, you can factor it out as well. And then you have the integral differential of T over T squared, which is just minus 1 over T. Right, so this is going to be the following, minus one over T, so I'm gonna take that out already. Uh, the change in enthalpy in the phase transition divided over R, and then it will be minus one over T, but that minus, I've already taken it out, so it will be uh, one over T, final, minus initial. Okay, very good. All right, so this is the integrated clausius clapeyron equation with definite limits. And again, the, the beauty of this, or what this allows you to do, is that if you know one point in your phase boundary, right, so this point, T1, P1 in that phase boundary, then you can predict the other point, right? So you can say, well, what would be the vapor pressure if the temperature was, say, 300 Kelvin or 350 Kelvin, right? 
you, you get to set that temperature and then you can predict this number. Or maybe the question will ask you, well, at what temperature will you have that the vapor pressure might be whatever. Right? So then you, uh, you're forecasting what this temperature would be if you know what this uh, vapor pressure is. So that's the, type of, uh, if you, that's the type of problems that you will see in the homework. Now, there's one more thing uh, that we have to realize here, and that is that in order to do this forecast, you actually need to know what the enthalpy of the phase transition is at this particular range of pressures and temperatures. Okay, uh, so a question is, well, if uh, 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 the change in the enthalpy of the phase transition needs to be known, could we actually use this expression to find out what this value is if we know two points in the phase diagram, right? So if we actually know what P1, uh, P2, T1, T2 are, right? We have that group of four data points. Could we actually use this equation to solve for the change in enthalpy to phase, trans phase transition? And the answer is yes, you can do that. Okay, but uh, there's actually a better way to uh, determine that change in enthalpy to phase transition. Okay, uh, uh, in this way, uh, you're only using two points to determine uh, that change in enthalpy to phase transition, and that is uh, dangerous because if there's a little bit of an error in any one of the P2, P1, T2, or T1 data that you're using for this, uh, for this determination of the change in enthalpy, then this is going to have quite a bit of error. Okay, so the question is, can you actually do this differently so that you can minimize potentially the error of these experimental numbers that you have to put in in order to get that uh, change in the enthalpy of the phase transition? Yes, so, so there's actually a better way to do this. And that is uh, that instead of using um, definite uh, integration, we're actually now going to use indefinite integration. So the idea is that now we're going to integrate this uh, without limits, so that, uh, and you guys will see how this turns out to be uh, a little on. Right, so I'm going to still leave this here because that still works for the forecast of uh, the points in these uh, phase boundaries. But now uh, we're going to concern ourselves with indefinite integration so that you can see another application right, which allows you to, uh, to obtain this uh, change in enthalpy of the phase transition with little error. Okay, great. So uh, now we integrate without uh, limits. That means that this is simply going to be natural log of p plus a constant that I'm going to call simply a. And then on the left-hand side of the equation, this is just a factor. So I'm going to have here my change in the phase transition, the enthalpy in the phase transition over r. And then the integral of differential of t over t squared is simply minus 1 over t plus a constant, which I'm simply going to call b. Right, so let me uh, reorganize this expression a little bit, and that is simply going to be natural log of p is equal to uh, minus delta of the phase transition alpha to gas molar over r, 1 over t, plus a constant that is just going to be uh, the balance of this a and b. I'm simply going to call this constant. Okay, so this actually tells you uh, the dependence of uh, the vapor pressure, okay, you give substance on temperature, and notice that that is uh, a function of that uh, molar enthalpy of the phase transition. Uh, again, the question is, how can we use this now to determine a good value for this uh, enthalpy of vaporization? All right, so uh, again, this is the uh, definite integration, that is the indefinite one. Uh, let me actually then s uh, show you how you can use that to your advantage, right? So again, the problem of using the equation that we had right here is that you were relying only on two points, and if one of them was a little sketchy in that it might have some experimental error, then your overall calculation of the enthalpy was in jeopardy, right? But notice that now you can, uh, if you use this, you have a, a chance of reducing that error. Why? Because you can involve here much more than two points, right? You can actually have a table in which you measure the vapor pressure of a substance as a function of temperature, and you might have maybe five values or six values or however many you want to, to uh, do. Now you can transform that into natural log of p and 1 over t, right? And still have those five values. 
but now you can represent them, right? Notice that this is actually the equation of a straight line, right? If you plot that as a natural log of p over 1 over t, okay? The idea is that this should be a straight line of slope minus the change in enthalpy in the phase transition divided by r and intercept this value, which is that doesn't have any uh, physical significance, right? So notice that your five points are now going to be something like this. Okay, so uh, you can fit that on the slope of this line, right? The slope of that line is going to be this value. Okay? And notice that this is going to be much more tolerant to error than using the equation with definite limits, right? And the idea is as follows. Notice that that point might have some error, right? So that is uh, like that, right? Notice that if you're actually using only these two points to calculate what the change in enthalpy is, you're going to get it completely wrong those two points or these two points, right? If that point is ever in your calculation, that's not so good. But uh, if you have many more points, then the error of that particular point is going to be washed away by the rest. Okay, so this is a far more robust calculation for the change in enthalpy in a phase transition. So actually this is how you determine the values of the vaporization enthalpies and the sublimation enthalpies that you have in tables. You simply uh, do measurements of the vapor pressure of that substance as a function of temperature, and do this representation in the integrated clashes clapeyron equation, fit those values, and then from the slope of your fit, you can determine what the enthalpy of the phase transition is. And that's something that you will uh, have an opportunity to play with in the homework. All right, so to summarize this video, we have seen how you can integrate the clashes clapeyron equation to make either predictions about points in this phase boundary from the knowledge of, of an initial point, or to maybe use various measurements uh, of the vapor pressures as a function of temperature uh, for a substance to then determine with uh, high accuracy what the enthalpy of the phase transition is.